Growing up, I was always a big fan of racing games, but while I've played some amazing titles focused on realistic motor racing, my absolute favourites have always been those futuristic high-speed titles. Things like F-Zero X on the Nintendo 64 and Wipeout 3 on the PlayStation ate up huge amounts of my time as I sought to cut split seconds off my track times. And if I'm being absolutely honest, they're probably partially responsible for me getting a 2-1 rather than the first at university. For this vid, I set out to do a little bit of racing in Star Citizen, in an attempt to shine a light on it for the wider community. But what ended up happening was a challenge that took me the length and breadth of Stanton, as I undeniably caught the bug and found that racing in SC is something of a spiritual successor to those classics of my youth. So if this sounds cool to you, grab a cup of tea while I roll the intro, then let's get into it. Hello and welcome back or welcome to the channel. I'm Loudguns and today we're going to be taking a look at racing in Star Citizen. Now I want to be clear from the start line that this is not a racing guide. Frankly, I'm just not good enough to deliver one. This is more a case of, if I can do it, then you can too. It's meant as a showcase of SC's racing gameplay and locations, the community that exists around it, and, I hope, a bit of encouragement for some of you to give it a go. And with this in mind, if you stay tuned, a bit later in the video, I'm going to detail how you can enter a competition to win a Mirai Fury LX racing ship of your very own. One thing I decided from the outset was that my VKB Evo sticks, as awesome as they are, are going to sit this one out. And I was going to default entirely to using keyboard and mouse for the whole thing. I really want to prove that you don't need thousands of dollars of peripherals to enjoy this aspect of the game. And similarly, I'm only going to use ships that I've bought in-game for Alpha UEC. So as long as you've got a PC that can run the game and a starter package, then you can do this exactly how I did with a bit of work. If this vid does inspire you to pick up Star Citizen, then just make sure you use a referral code when you create an account. Mine's the one up on screen, but if you do have any friends who play already, please just ask them for theirs. So admittedly, the one exception, I did use some cash store bought paints, but contrary to popular belief, these just make your ship look cool and regardless of colour, don't actually make you go any faster. So a few patches ago we had a pretty huge racing update, with tracks that had been long established by the racing community getting spruced up by the in-game developers, who built up buildings and terrain around them to define them that bit better. And this also came with a series of racing missions that can be accessed via the contract manager. You'll find these in the general tab under, surprise surprise, the racing category. The much improved Arena Commander module, which we'll look at later in this vid, does allow you to enter instanced versions of these tracks. And while this is fantastic, I personally wanted the raw Persistent Universe experience, travelling around the tracks and facing the elements, while building up my reputation as a racer. As someone who's played SC a lot for the past few years, I'm always on the lookout for new lenses through which to experience the game, and get around the different locations of the system. So to start our adventure into the world of racing, we're heading to the planet Hurston, and I've set my spawn at the low orbital station Everest Harbour. The first track, Lawville Outskirts, is down on the city limits of Hurston's major landing zone. So while you might have a shorter flight from the city's Tisa spaceport, the journey time on the train if you're coming from the hospital due to high-speed collisions is pretty high. Meanwhile from Everest, you've got a far quicker trip from clinic to hangar to track, if you need it, and trust me, I needed it. Taking this approach does mean you'll need to select a ship with a quantum drive though. So popular racing snubs like the P-52, P-72 and the Furies will be out unless you like flying 200km on your hydrogen engines. Personally, as my first racer, I picked the Mirai Razor, formerly known as the Misk Razor. The brand's been split into two, with Misk maintaining the industrial options like the Prospector, Freelancers and Hull series, while the newly founded Mirai is home to the high-performance vehicles. Razor was the second racing ship I ever tried out, and I get massive Formula 1 vibes from it. The slender profile, spoilers, and on the standard model, sponsored decals really scream that this ship is all about speed. The track itself is located just on the other side of the main Hurston Dynamics building, from the lights of the spaceport. 
and as I cruised in over the city, I was treated to the bright golden lights of Lawville 2.0. That being said, upon arrival at the track, I thought it was probably best to wait for the sunrise so I could stand a better chance of seeing the wolves and the cranes I was trying to avoid. As the sun came up, I decided to set out for a sedate cruise around the track. I'd always recommend this for any new racers or people discovering a new track for the first time. It can be very, very easy to lose track of your speed, so take the time to tour the track, learning some of the twists and turns before you attempt to dial things up. The markers will show you the checkpoints and guide you through the track, which I have to say, as someone who did try racing before this existed, is an absolute godsend in terms of a more accessible experience. But there are still bugs, it is Star Citizen after all. So depending on how your server is feeling, you might experience some delays in them appearing. But by slowly building up your knowledge, by the time you're ready to start laying down fast times, you'll know where they are pretty intuitively. One thing that I love about racing is that it will force you to become a better pilot if you want to succeed. Keep in mind that most ships will turn quicker if you pitch as opposed to yaw, and you'll subject yourself to less g-forces so you won't black out as easily. When trying to make tight turns, it's often better to roll your ship so you can pull up through them, as opposed to maintaining a flat position and trying to yaw through them. It will also teach you to pay more attention to your vector indicator. This element of your HUD indicates to you the direction that your ship's actually moving. So just because you flip the direction you're facing in your cockpit doesn't mean the ship is travelling that way yet. And also, you'll get a feel for just how precious your boost is. When racing, your shields aren't going to save you, and your weapons, in most cases, are useless. As we'll see later on some of the more challenging tracks, I started to copy the more experienced racers in my org and ditched weapons and shields entirely just to lighten the ship. Definitely push 100% of your capacitor power to thrusters though, and take care to manage that boost bar. It'll push you to higher speeds in the straights and it'll allow you to make quicker turns, but if you run out at the wrong moment, you'll be up the proverbial creek. And as I experimented, of course there were crashes. You'll clip a crane or you'll oversteer into a wall. You just pick yourself up and you try again. In most of my videos, I make a big deal about wearing armour and carrying weapons just in case something happens, but when it comes to racing, there is nothing wrong at all with a noob suit, or a tactical medical gown. You can get extra style points for wearing cool clothes while you race, but there's no practical reason to risk equipment when you're just one mistake away from a fireball. But eventually, with a bit of perseverance, even I was able to clock a platinum run. The racing missions are effectively time trials. You pay an entry fee to race, then it's you against the clock. Your time will either be rated as a finish, which will return you your entrance fee, or if you do better, bronze, silver, gold, or ultimately platinum. Each of these will just give you a progressively better payout. Now, I wouldn't say, compared to other gaming loops, that racing is likely to lead you to the land of riches. But it's more about the fun and the expression of skill, and the payouts from successful completions don't hurt when it comes to repair and reclaim bills for your chosen ride. And as you complete races, you'll notice that your reputation with Wildstar Racing, the NPC organisation that issues the contracts, will increase and more of Stanton's tracks will unlock for you. Of course, the tracks are always there, but the missions are gated behind this rep. Now I'll be honest, when I decided to make a video about racing, I planned to rack up a platinum finish at Lawville Outskirts, then have a quick tour around a few of the other tracks and cap it there. But something clicked in me while I was zooming around the Lawville track and I found myself just having an insane amount of fun. So I decided that I'd set myself a challenge of achieving a platinum finish on all of the seven racetracks dotted around the Stanton system. Not all of the tracks are so convenient though. Orville's a really nice starter because after setting your spawn at either Everest or the city itself, you're always just a quick journey back to the start line. But some of the other tracks are far more remote. So safe in the knowledge that I was likely to smash up a few ships before I smashed each platinum track time, I realised I was going to need a proper racing bus. And there is literally nothing better in game right now for this job than the Origin 890 jump. Not only does the 890 offer luxurious accommodation, it also benefits from a sizeable hangar, capable of housing a number of racing craft. And it's even got its very own tier 2 medical facilities allowing you to set your respawn point at the ship. And this means you'll be able to park up trackside and start clocking times without fear of crashing out. 
I wasn't quite sure what was in store, so for my first outing I loaded up four Mirai Razors, a couple of Kruger P52 Merlins and a pair of Mirai Fury LXs. The added benefit of bringing your own carrier like this is it does open up the snubs which don't have quantum drives to get themselves around. So with our packing done, it was time to set course for Euterpe in the Microtech system. The icebreaker makes use of a scientific research facility, with some awesome ascents and descents as you follow the mountainous terrain and tight squeezes between the laboratories. Unfortunately, as is tradition, after a leisurely flight from Hurston, I arrived at nightfall on Euterpe, with an added snowstorm thrown in so you really couldn't see very much. So once again, I decided to go to bed and wait for the dawn. The benefit to bringing your own racing bus though, is that you can always just head to one of your stately rooms and log out. Which leads us nicely into the Arena Commander module, that you can always use to practice or get straight into the action if you don't have time to do this in the PU. Just in case you don't know about it, the Arena Commander module is accessed from the main menu and contains a number of instance ship combat, FPS combat and racing modes. You can choose to compete against other players in online racing, or use it more as a practice tool in solo offline mode. This is just perfect for when you're waiting out bad conditions in the PU. It can be a really good tool to get familiar with tracks, particularly since you have zero downtime if you crash, and you'll always be coming back at them in the optimal conditions. The AC tracks also have more obvious signposting for turns, so it can be a bit easier to familiarise yourself with the layout. You can rent any ships you like with the REC currency that you can most easily earn by completing in game modes like Pirate and Vandal Swarm. Just make sure you're in online mode to rack that up though. You can then make any modifications you like to the vehicle in the ship selection menus. AC also has a few more tracks than the PU, including the Gravlev hoverbike track that was initially designed by one of my friends Fedical, so definitely check that out. But one of the main reasons I love the PU side of racing is because it is that bit more challenging. There's additional logistics forcing you to take the measures like I did with my 890, and weather conditions that can change on a dime. And nowhere did I feel this more than at the icebreaker, where things flipped from a bright sunny day to a whiteout in an instant. I ran some practice laps in the Razor, and was getting quite comfortable with the track, but I decided to switch things up a bit and bring out one of my Mirai Fury LXs, the racing version of the Fury Snub series. And this thing is a completely different experience. The Fury has amazing manoeuvring thrusters that gimbal around, allowing you to pull off turns that a more traditional ship like the Razor would just find impossible. I particularly found that due to this thruster setup, the Fury feels more forgiving if you resort to your base turns than other ships, and it's a lot more able to strafe, which, particularly with up and down strafing, I found was really helpful with the ascents and descents in the icebreaker track. That said, it's definitely one of those ships where I think you have to be very conscious of the speed control because the acceleration on it is just so off the charts that you can find yourself hurtling far too quickly into a turn. For people who are using joysticks, they have maybe more control over exactly what speed they're going, but for those of us who are using keyboard and mouse, you just have to use the speed limiter to keep that under wraps. So with the icebreaker in the bag, we were next headed to the skyline of Area 18 on Artcorp. We're in a complete change of pace from the remote abandoned facilities of Euterpe, we're going to be racing between the towering skyscrapers of the city. I experimented with a few of my ships for this track, but the one I found myself really gelling with the most around the hairpin turns and narrow passes between the buildings of the skyscraper course was the Kruger P-52 Merlin. Like the Fury, this pocket rocket lacks a QT drive. So we need some form of carrier to bring it to a number of the courses, although the skyscraper is close enough that you could fly one from the Area 18 spaceport quite quickly. However, one of the letdowns of the skyscraper track in particular is the checkpoints. These are a bit hit and miss, and of all of the tracks, I found my passage through them not registering, which was pretty frustrating. My org Frontier Consolidated has one of the best racing teams out there and our race director Tint was explaining to me that the skyscraper's gates are renowned for being misleading. They're actually a bit narrower and shorter than they may appear to be on the screen. If you would like any help or cool tips like this, 
or you just want to find people to hang out with in game, then please do pop into our Discord and say hi. The link's just down in the video description below. Really annoyingly, I clocked what was certainly a platinum finish in my P52, only for the finish line gate to fail on me. In my attempt to whip the Merlin round and scramble back in time, I unceremoniously met a wall. So a little bit angry, and now out of stock of P52s, I hopped into one of my Fury LXs and laid down a new personal best in what I can only describe as an anger lap. As you can probably tell, ships as manoeuvrable as the Fury are where you start to feel some of the limitations of the mouse and keyboard setup, and understand why many serious racers will choose to go with the more precise control methods like HOSAS. And maybe because my tempo was up a bit, I did have to correct for a few overzealous rolls and turns. But even with a few mistakes, I was still able to pull things together enough for a platinum finish. And it is worth highlighting at this point, plat finishes aren't the best of the best, and when it comes to serious races, they're often laying down times which are far quicker. So most of the platinum times in these trials are relatively forgiving, and will allow for a few mistakes. Sometimes, ironically, it was after messing up a bit that I then achieved my goal, as some of the pressure to deliver a perfect run came off the table, and I just flew for the sake of flying. Admittedly, I had been so annoyed at the start of the run that I forgot to put on any clothes, so maybe it was this weight reduction that really sealed the faster time. With 3 out of 7 of the tracks under my belt, I was starting to feel pretty confident, so naturally it was time for me to get knocked down on my ass. And the track that did that was the OG, the Snake Pit out on Clio. Snake Pit was one of the first community created tracks to get CIG's special treatment. A course popularised by the racing organisation XGR, it was a canyon run through the moon's terrain, and the devs gave racers a bit of a helping hand in terms of navigation by adding this industrial site around it, bringing in beams and cranes to keep the flight ceiling nice and low. And the snake pit very almost broke me. More pointedly, it broke nearly every ship I threw at it, and I turned into a fiery ball more times than I cared to count. Admittedly, this was a low point in the challenge for me. This was one of those moments where I wondered what the hell I was doing, and considered rolling back on my idea and just putting together a bit of a simpler summary. But still, I couldn't quite shake that I wanted this achievement. So I took a little look at the SCR website to see if I could get any hints. Star Citizen Racing, or SCR, is the de facto home of unofficial racing bragging rights including leaderboards for the fastest times around all the various tracks, both CIG approved ones and purely community driven ones. Racers submit their times and evidence to get placed in the rankings. And one thing that I couldn't help but notice was that 100% of the top times at Snake Pit were clocked in one ship, the Merlin's big brother, the P-72 Archimedes. Now there's probably someone, or many someones, out there in the racing community who can tell you clearly and succinctly exactly what makes the Archimedes king. I'm pretty sure we might be able to see some of that down in the comments to this video. But that person isn't me, so all I'm gonna say is that this ship absolutely slaps in this type of flying. On my first run in the P-72, I noticed an instant improvement with a gold finish that clocked as a personal best, and after just a few more, I got my hands on the coveted platinum finish, and that sense of accomplishment which went with it. And I realised this is where racing in SC really excels, because guys in my org like Tint, Prof Decoy, Noise Maze, Volta, they could all get round two laps of Snake Pit for every time I make it round. But this doesn't take away from my achievement in pushing my own skills, breaking my own personal rests, and laying my hands on that platinum time. So having crossed the halfway mark and with my confidence and enthusiasm restored, it was time to head to Crusader for the next track. There have been a few problems this patch with docking collars, so I didn't fancy parking the bus at Orison itself for Seraphim. So despite some reservations, I entrusted my baby to the valets at Grimhex, where I could leave it safely in a hangar, and I headed down to Orison in a smaller ship. As was tradition by this point, I arrived at night, with a bit of shore leave, there was a good chance to stop at the Voyager bar for a G&T while I waited for the dawn. I decided to take this opportunity to test out another of SC's racing ships, the consolidated Outland Mustang Gamma. Mustangs Alpha and Beta are familiar starter ship options, but the Gamma racing variant stands out as one of the most affordable, QT-capable options at 627,500 credits. 
The Kaplan industrial platform track makes use of some of the floating structures dotted around the Cloud City. And this is where the high fidelity design of Star Citizen's universe really stands out, because from a traditional gameplay perspective, there's no real reason for these structures to exist in such high detail. The fact that these catwalks and underpasses are all here and physicalized wouldn't even be noticed by most players, but they provided the terrain for racers to concoct a hair-raising track of slaloms and rapid enclosed straits. And then the devs came along and just helped to heighten this experience. I do have to say, the additional work that CIG have done to develop the racing gameplay loop really stands out for me on this one. As I remember about a year ago, going along to one of the Frontier Racing Team's track days where Tint attempted to teach me this course, and I just got completely lost every time. With the scenery going by too quickly for me to keep track of, and my frequent crashes meaning that I'd often forgotten the later parts of the course on the times that I succeeded at the earlier stages. But while the checkpoint markers aren't perfect, and they can be a bit server dependent, they do massively help with the accessibility of racing. They let you build up that knowledge in your own time, and develop the muscle memory required. I was almost certain that I was going to clock myself on one of these beams in the catwalk sections, but narrowly avoided them and managed to lay down my plat time before heading back to pick up the bus at Grimm so we could move on to course number 6. The next track, Yadar Valley on Daymar, to my mind should be the finale. It's the one where I think you have to take everything you learned in previous challenges and put it into practice if you want to emerge victorious. Knowing that I was heading for another low-flying, tight-turning, high-G moon track, I took on board my Snake Pit experience and I made a brief detour to Area 18's Astra Armada, where I invested in just a few more P-72 Archimedes. And I found that with a little neat parking, I could load the bus up with eight of them. Hopefully, this would prove to be enough. And admittedly, I left a good few P-72 wrecks in Yadar Valley. But as one of the more frequent dust storms cleared and I got a clear break, I flew my proverbial skin off and found myself getting really into the flow of this fantastic track. This was where the nostalgia of games like F-Zero X, Star Wars Pod Racer and Wipeout 3 really cemented itself, as I found myself craning my neck and rocking from side to side in my chair as I just fully immersed myself in the experience. I particularly love the verticality that comes into play with racing in Star Citizen, with the option in ship racing to place checkpoint gates that force you to rise and fall through a truly three-dimensional track. While I pressed on after Yadar to head to the seventh and final track of the challenge, I think the valley is going to be one of the tracks I head back to the most in the PU and in AC, just for the sheer thrill and pure enjoyment I got out of this circuit. And so finally we head to the asteroid rings of Yella, a little way out from that hive of scum and villainy that is Grimhex, to the only official Zero-G track, Miner's Lament. And I mentioned that the Mirai Razor was the second racing ship I ever tried, but the first was the Origin M50. I'm not usually a big Origin fan, 890 racing buses notwithstanding. I always made an exception for the M50, which always got me with that rule of cool. So I thought why not give it a shot and throw it at Miner's Lament for the finale. And because I have to be honest, while the M50 did not let me down in any way, I do feel that the Miner's Lament track is a little bit anticlimactic. At this point I was chatting quite a bit in the racing channels of our Discord, and Tint's summary of Miner's Lament was quite accurate. Don't crash and you'll be fine. While the Lament has a few scary moments with passes through holes in the abandoned mining outpost that are barely visible as you hurtle towards them, it is largely an exercise in speed control. With no atmosphere to slow you down, it is incredibly easy if you're not paying attention to find yourself doing upwards of a thousand meters per second, making some of the turns next to impossible without colliding into an asteroid. But if you exhibit just a bit of self-control in terms of speed, it's arguably the easiest of all of the tracks to clock a platinum time on. 
Now, don't get me wrong, I was very happy to have completed my challenge, but compared to the pure exhilaration and elation of clocking that plat finish at Yadar Valley just an hour or so beforehand, registering this run on my second attempt and without a single fireball was just a little bit meh. So I had an amazing time getting into racing in SE, and I found this challenge to be a perfect, relatively accessible way to do it that didn't involve committing tracks to memory. I think CIG have done a fantastic job of implementing racing in the PU, which with its logistical and environmental challenges added to that sense of accomplishment versus doing it in Arena Commander. Arena Commander is always sitting there if you want that just instant get up and go. I still think there is some room for improvement as the game evolves, and I think the most important change that could be made and could open up the racing loop in the PU to more players would be to place small clinics and Platinum Bay Aesops next to every track allowing racers to set their spawn and call their ships on sight. As I said at the start of the video, I did everything here entirely with stuff bought in game for AUEC. There's a regular player, an avid industrialist, the 32 million credits for an 890 jump and additional millions on multiple copies of racing ships was just well within reach for me, but it might be a bigger barrier to other players. And obviously we've benefited in recent patches from little in the way of wipes and some massive earners like the drug running boom and structural salvage. So many wallets are full to bursting point now, but they might not be further down the line. Respawn points and ship recall locations wouldn't need to be massive, and they could be much smaller than those found at even space stations. So it's not like they'd add loads of server load, but they would just make the loop that much more accessible to players. But if you find that you've got the racing bug, the ultimate next step really is to get involved with community racing events, and pit yourself directly against other players. Mechanically, I feel Star Citizen really holds up well against other racing games, but it's in moments like this that I think it outclasses them. The possibility with the scale that this game has to get hundreds of players together in the same place and organise a race, with not just competitors, but camera crews, medical teams, salvagers to clear the track of debris, and refueling ships for pit stops is absolutely incredible, and only set to get better as player numbers expand with server meshing. I recently got involved with the 2954 Crux Cup hosted by our friends over at Anzia Racing, a huge endurance race around the skyline of Lawville, complete with multiple classes for all sorts of different ships. This just proves that absolutely any ship can be a racing ship if you want it to be. Personally, I entered the Aurora class, and I love that by limiting all the competitors to the same starter ship, this is just becoming a pure expression of skill. You could also look at options like the Open or the Pro class if you want to pick the absolute meta ships and just hurtle around at breakneck speeds. There's also a number of other options. I recently attempted the Northfield Sprint, which was a ground racing cyclone track on Microtech, and a lot of you will obviously have caught the Daymar Rally, the annual ground race of uh, marathon-like proportions. As you might know from previous videos, I'm a long-time, long-suffering League of Legends enthusiast, and being a bit older and having played since the beta, I recall the very first esports casts in Season 1, and the racing scene in Star Citizen is already just way beyond that, so I feel this is where SC could really have a future in terms of esports. So to round things off, I thought I'd head back to where it began at Lawville Outskirts, but this time with a bunch of my mates from the Frontier community. There's something just undeniably cool about kicking back for an evening, whipping around a racetrack, celebrating new personal bests, and just laughing at the inevitable fireballs. I'm under no impression that I'm a great racer, but the idea behind this video was never to prove that I was. It was to show how fun racing in Star Citizen can be, and hopefully encourage some of you to give it a go, even if you'd never considered it before. Because planted in the back of my mind is that someone out there watching this could be the next fastest speed demon in the verse. So to this end, I want to put my money where my mouth is, and set a little challenge for anyone who wants to get involved. I'm going to be giving away a Mirai Fury LX, but to get yourself entered into the draw, you're going to need to lay down a Platinum Time on the Lawville Outskirts track. All details will be in the video description down below, but essentially you'll need to record your run and upload it to YouTube with the title Loud Guns Racing Challenge, then post a link to that in a thread on our Discord. Run has to be done in the Persistent Universe, not AC, so that you battle the elements as well as the track. But as I hope I've shown in this vid, regardless of your skill level or your setup, with a bit of practice this should be completely achievable. And with a bit of luck this challenge will just be the start of your racing career. 
To close out this video, I've asked members of the Frontier Racing team to tell us their favourite thing about going fast. But just before I go, I'd like to say a big thank you for watching all the way to the end. And if you think I've earned it, I would of course be very grateful if you leave a like and hit subscribe for more content. I do also have a Patreon, but honestly, just by watching this vid, you are already doing more than enough. So I'll catch you in the next one. My favourite thing about going fast is that I can do it in just about any ship not just racing ships. I can race with large ships, ground vehicles, even a mole. The wide variety of styles and flavors of going fast in Star Citizen is amazing. What is my favorite thing about going fast? It's knowing that there is a team beside me. That I am supported by org, friends, and family. And when I achieve incredible feats of speed and skill, that it was made possible because we worked together and proved what seemed impossible, possible. My favorite thing about going fast is challenging myself, testing whether today's me can beat yesterday's me while also giving tomorrow's me a run for his money. One of my favorite things about going fast is watching racers set their own personal challenges and how much fun they have overcoming them. Racing in Star Citizen is honestly one of the most amazing experiences I've ever had gaming. And I think all that comes back to the community and what we've built and why. There's tracks, events, methods, all built by a community of hundreds of people who just love this game and this experience. And they share without reservation, without jealously guarding secrets. I've gotten to build a team with and compete with some of the most amazing humans on the planet. And I think all of that positive energy comes back to the fact that at the end of the day, we're not really competing with each other. We're competing with ourselves, and there's something really powerful about that many people sitting down and looking at themselves in the mirror through their own times and saying, okay me, what do you got?